Okay, um, I'm talking today about change um, and what you can do to, to drive the change, manage it um, and make the change happen in a way that you want, um, in the direction that you also want. A bit of a background of, of myself, kind of to, to give you context on, on where I'm coming from and, and uh, what kind of, I don't know, experience uh, I've used uh, coming to this point. I'd say that Nokia plays a huge role in my, my uh, career and my expertise. So I'm, I come from Finland and in Finland it's almost like a national service to serve a couple of years at Nokia. Or actually, or at least it, it used to be like that. It doesn't happen anymore because, yeah, you know the, the story. Um, quite quickly um, after my graduation, I joined Nokia doing uh, user experience. Uh, my first job around UX was um, defining how user experience is, is measured uh, within the company when, when they were doing internal beta testing. That was a really good introduction to how a big corporation works and how they make sure that the quality is in place before they launch uh, the product or the service. Um, after a while, I wanted to try consulting and, and I joined a smallish uh, agency. Uh, after two or three weeks, they sent me to a client project and the client was Nokia. Um, so it, it became quite, quite obvious to me that Nokia was my destiny. Um, <laughs> And well, luckily, I, I was put to a really interesting project, and we were looking into a completely new area, which was uh, open source um, product. So we didn't have any, any limitations in terms of what is the old Nokia legacy, but we could really start thinking uh, out of the box. And I, I followed the project from, from the concepting to the very end, which was the, the uh, product launch and shipping. Uh, after Half a year or so, the, the, uh, the team leader asked me to join the company instead of being a consultant. And since it was quite clear that I was destined to be with Nokia, I, I would rather be an employee than a consultant. Um, after the product, which was later called N9, um, shipped, I decided to leave the company because they were going to, to Microsoft things, and I didn't really believe that. So I set up my own business which was a lot of fun, taught me a lot about what is, really, what, what is that really matters uh, in business and, and how do you, do you need to make sure that you have the basics right and you get money in and that's in the end all that matters. But 2012, so a bit more than five years ago, we got the opportunity to move to Singapore uh, and that's when I closed the business and, and moved here with my family. Really good decision. I've enjoyed my time uh, really, really much. Uh, for the past, for the, for the first four years, I was running a small UX agency. But last spring, I, I uh, left the company and joined uh, BHP, which, if you don't know, is a mining company. So very traditional uh, industry. Um, they knew nothing about UX. Well, they do now. Uh, because for the past year or so, they've had their own UX team. But the thing here is that the company has been working on a certain way for decades. And this whole thing that is called user centricity is really new to them. It's not really about customer experience, because you know, nobody buys iron ore. Um, for them, it's all about employee experience which is pretty cool. So for a company that has no background and history in, in user experience, what they start to do is thinking about the employee experience and how can they make things better for the people that are really doing the work. And that's really where a lot of my, my learnings come from, because seeing how a huge corporation transforms from something something that without any UX to something where they are trying to integrate user experience to any, everything they do has been highly uh, interesting and also rewarding because with small changes you actually, sh actually see really big results. So what is change? Really simple, simple way, in a really simple way it's a transition from something very familiar to something new. 
And when we talk about something familiar, people that, that, something that people are comfortable with, it's something that they, they want to, to stay. That is the status quo. And for most people, that's what, how they want to continue. Through the change, they are learning something new, which for most people is something a bit intimidating and even scary. And that's really something human. So the human nature is change resistant. Obviously, there are a lot of people who, who want to, to make the change happen, um, but you need to understand that there will be always a lot of people who are not ready for that change. And you need to support those people in going through that change and making them understand that the change is for the good. Before you start the change or you start driving for the change, you need to understand what it is that you are really changing. Is it maybe the organization? Is it the company culture? That's a really, really big change, or even huge, like Donald Trump would say. Um, are you changing the strategy, the direction where the company or the team is going? Still big thing. You need to, to consider a lot of different things and how things are linked to each other. Or maybe just a product or, or a feature. Smaller change, but still you need to, to go through the transition and support the people who are involved in the change. Um, and in all of these, you need to understand who are affected by the change and make sure that those people are comfortable with that change. When we talk about change, it's something that happens all the time. Uh, it's inevitable, you, you, you can't really stop it. Um, it's always there. And to be honest, you don't even want to stop it, because change is what keeps the, the wheels of the life rolling. That's what makes us evolve, that's what makes all the services and products evolve. But what you want to do is you want to manage it. You want to make sure that the change is going to a direction that you want. Because in the end, um, when we talk about user experience, you want what is best for the end users, whoever they are. And sometimes people might have a bit different views on what is really important and, and, and uh, beneficial for the end users. So that's why you want to be involved in that change, to make sure that whatever happens supports that goal that you hopefully have. When you start driving for the change, you need to make sure that your foundations are properly built. If you are new to the organization or the team that you are working for, the first thing you need to do is to, to gain credibility and trust. If you're a new employee to a company, nobody knows you. So why would they listen to you? You're just one of the others. You're the new thing with new ideas, maybe some new scary ideas. So you are the person that don't gratter. But if you make sure that you have some important message to give, that you know what you're doing, they will start trusting you. They will start listening to you. If, you, if you've been with the company for a longer time uh, and they know you, it will be easier. But if you are changing what you do um, to something else, people might be very suspicious on like, what's that dude doing? Like, we've been doing this really well this far, so what do we have to change? So again, you need to make sure that whatever you're doing is something, or that whatever you're doing is really like um, creating trust within the people around you, because you will need those people. And that's the second thing. You need to understand the people you work with. You can't do the change by yourself. You need a team. You need to engage the people that will do the change with you. So first thing you need to do is to identify who are the key people who will help you uh, reach your goal. Are they the decision makers? Are they the influence, influencers of the organization? Who are the ones that will help the others go through that change? If we talk about the product, it might be the product manager who defines or decides what are the changes that will be, will be done. So you need to make sure that that person is behind you and, and understands where you're coming from and understands why you are doing this, whatever you're doing. 
The second thing is that you need to understand what, what kind of goals these people have. I mentioned earlier how change is always a personal uh, transformation. So this is the key thing. For each and every individual, they will have something personal they want to gain with that change. If you can align your activities with their goals, they will support you. It's, it's all, all, always about winning. And if you can help them become better, if you can help them to be more successful in what they are doing, they will want to work with you. And it's not that you're giving something away from yourself because you're just giving something for the person and in exchange, you'll get their support. You need to also understand the environment. When we talk about companies, when we talk about business, it's all about benefit, business benefit. In the end, usually it's all about money. And although there might be some higher goals in making things more pleasant or, or more satisfactory or, or, I don't know, save the world, in the end, the organization needs to get some benefit from that. And the earlier you understand this, the earlier you will succeed as well. When you start planning your activities, you need to understand how that whatever you're doing will contribute to the, the bigger goal or the bigger business benefit. And if you can do that, you will get the support for your activities. And how you do that? Metrics. All well, these are, by the way, my cats, really gorgeous little creatures. Um, metrics is your tool to show that business benefit. I think more and more companies are, are asking for uh, ROI of user experience. And there's no solution or, 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 I don't know, golden rule on what is the ROI of, of user experience. What you can do is, is uh, put metrics in, in everything that you do. With, with metrics, you can show the effect of the change that you are proposing. And when you get the numbers in place, you can bring in the money. You start multiplying actions with, I don't know, cost savings, um, increase in sales, customer retention, whatever that is. You need those numbers, because otherwise you can't really prove yourself right. There are very few companies who have the luxury of doing anything and everything they want. Most of them are in constant negotiation over what they can do and what they will do. And that means that you will be competing with other people and other teams in terms of what will be done. And I can assure you that those others will have their numbers in place and they will show the, the leadership how their idea will benefit the company in short term or long term. And if you don't have your numbers, you will lose the game. So that's why this is, if, if, if there's two things that you, you remember from this one is that you need to remember the, the business benefit and, and the metrics because those are, the, those are your safeguards that make sure that you get to do what you want to do. So, how do you make that happen? Probably by the topic of my, my talk, you, you guessed that my solution is user research. And why I'm all for user research is because User research gives you behavior instead of opinions. You might be a really respectable and really experienced designer or, or, or product manager, and people might listen to you. But unless you have no facts to back up your opinions, it's just opinion against someone else's opinion. 
But if you can show behavior related to, to your, or that backs up whatever you are proposing, it gives you the, the power of all those people that you've been researching. So that's a big difference. So when you start planning your research, you need to understand the direction where the company is going. So what are the KPIs that they have on, on higher level? Is the company trying to cut costs? Are they trying to expand in the market? Are they, are they trying to, to reach out to new consumer segment? Are they trying to increase productivity? You need to understand that. Because your research and the data that, that you bring to, from your research, that needs to support those company goals. Because this is, again, the same thing as, as I was talking before. You need the support from the others so that they will let you do your work and let you do that change that you, you believe in. So align your UX strategy with the company strategy. If you, don't, if you haven't created, or depending on, on what kind of position you are in, if your team doesn't have a UX strategy, I really recommend to start working on that. What is it that you want to do? What is the direction where you're going? And how you will reach those goals eventually? And make sure that that strategy is aligned with the company strategy, because if it's not, you, don't get, you won't get the buy-in from the leadership. The next thing is when you do your research, you need to understand what is it that drives the behavioral change. People obviously they will do something and, and they, will, they will say something, um, but that, that doesn't mean that they will continue doing things in the longer run. I was recently involved in one project um, where the company, um, heavily using SAP, um, wanted to introduce Fiori uh, for the employees. So Fiori is the mobile interface, uh, simplified interface for, of, of SAP. So what, what the team did was uh, they designed the Fiori applications based on the research that they did and they launched it. Two years fast forward, they realized that the adoption rate was somewhere around 4%. So they, ha they had this really nice new tool that nobody was using. So I was asked to, to, to find out what was wrong, what is the reason for the, the low uh, adoption rate, and what they could do to change that. It turned out that when SAP long time ago was introduced, they did this huge, big, big rollout uh, process. Uh, they, they did the roadshow, they visited all the, all the different uh, sites, um, they helped people to get started, started with SAP, set up the systems and so on. With theory, they just threw it over the fence and, and said that, okay, there you go, have fun. And I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever used SAP, but it's not something that you want to use. It's something that you have to use to support leadership. So although theory might have been able to ease up certain things, when nobody was there to help them to, to go through that change, they didn't do that. They didn't have time for that. They were really like under pressure all the time. And when the, when the solution didn't do everything that they were expecting, they rather stayed with SAP because they knew what it was, how it worked, and they knew that they could complete their work using that. So they did two big mistakes. First of all, they didn't find out what are the key things for people to, to uh, use the system, and they didn't help them um, start using it. Now we are in the process of trying to make that change happen again, and, and hopefully 
sometime next year uh, we will get that adoption rate uh, up again. Key thing here is that you need to understand why people behave the way they do. So it's not just what people do, but why. Because if you're going to try to change that behavior, you will need to understand where they are going. You need to prove, prove, prove yourself right, especially when you're doing something completely new. Um, if you want other teams to get your, or take, take help from you, employ you, you need to first make sure that they, they know that you, what you're doing helps them. Good way to do that is to, to start somewhere doing something small, letting them see those small, small, small incremental changes and what is the effect of the work. And then once you get that buy-in, you can start gr growing big. Um, in my current work, although the attitude towards user experience and the work that we do is positive, we are still in constant, um, I don't know, process of proving ourselves right and, and uh, like making sure that we, we get to exist in the organization. So um, if we want people to, to um, engage us, we need to make sure that they understand the benefit that they are getting. That might mean that you have to do something on your own time, voluntarily, without having someone to ask you to do things. As one example, um, I, I had identified through my conversations with the, with the different employees, I had identified a pain point um, in a uh, travel system. I created a small mock-up. It was just a really, really small thing. So changing one field to another one. I did a small mock-up. I did guerrilla testing. So just gave the mock-up to a person randomly uh, met in the cafeteria, asked people to, to do that task using that mock-up. And I took time. Then I asked from, from the, the um, travel team to give me the, the records of how many transactions we are doing on a monthly basis using this. With that one change in one field, like we talk about a system with, I don't know, 30, 40 different fields and, and it's a complicated system. Changing that one field, we calculated that even like carefully estimated the company would uh, make savings of 25,000 US dollars every year. Just one field. I showed this to the, the uh, team lead who is responsible for the travel system. What she wanted to do is to know what else can we do. So she wanted us to uh, find out what are the other pain points. Because if we can, with this really teeny tiny change, get this saving, which is not much, but she already knew that we could do much more because that was not the biggest, biggest problem that, that she has. So it's all about finding something that they recognize and they see the benefit and then working from there to, to bigger things. My last point is, is on on choosing what you do. Um, we don't always get to choose what kind of projects we engage with, or um, who do we collaborate with. But even within, within those, those um, projects that you, you might get involved in, you can choose where do you concentrate more. And if you want to, to gain good results, you want to concentrate in, in those parts that, that are all about volume. So it might be that um, we talk about something that, that everybody in the company does every day. So you, you, you get to, to multiply with the amount of employees and, and the days. Or it might be something that a small team does all the time. 
and because of, of those constant repetitions, you get those volumes. I was doing one project uh, earlier this year, um, and my role in that project was, was questioned by the leadership, um, just because of the cost, because the company is going through cost cutting. So they wanted me to, to prove that I'm worth it, that the investment in my salary is, is worth it. So within that project, I, I chose one um, case, use case. Um, this was one of, of like tens of, of different use cases, but since I was working a lot of things that were more difficult to, to put metrics on, um, I identified one that would show the, the power of the work. So I, I identified one, um, I don't know, pain point in the process where um, a small team would um, actually spend most of their time working as a middleman, just passing over emails between different parties. And we calculated that this team of a bit less than 20 people, they spent almost 75% of their work time in responding and forwarding emails about travel updates, uh, processing uh, changes. And just by giving access to these different parties, to the same travel system that the teamers were using as viewers or, or, or just being, giving people opportunity to, to edit their travel plans themselves, we estimated that the yearly savings would be um, almost 800,000 US dollars per year. And you know, I'm not that well paid that my, my cost would be more than that. So when we showed these numbers, the leadership, they went quiet. So they had a, haven't really questioned uh, our work after that. Obviously, the, the reality is, is, is not always this. So this is, this is, these are all, all theoretical calculations. But in the end, if you can put metrics on what you're doing, you can at least put some numbers behind it, and then you can put the cost or, or the benefit or the, the uh, revenue increase. And with those numbers, you can prove yourself right, and you can really show that the direction where you want the, the company to go is the right one. So, to summarize, first you need to build the foundation. You need to, to understand what you need to ha have in place first before you can start uh, driving the change and, and doing your, your research. You need the trust, you need the credibility. You need to, to understand the key players, those, that you, those that you, who will do the change together with you. You need to understand the environment. Where is the company going? Um, what is the business benefit? How do you prove yourself right? How do you put numbers on your, on your work? and then you just make it happen. My, my solution is user research, but obviously um, there are other, other ways of, of making the change happen. Um, users for me is, is the, the key thing, because in the end, users are the only thing that matters. If the users are not comfortable, um, you have nothing. If you don't, ha you, if you don't have your, your customer support, you don't have anything. You need to align your work with the higher core goals. You need to understand what is it that makes people to change their behavior. If, if the, the, the UX practice is new, start small. Find that small thing that proves you right, and then expand to, to, to bigger activities, bigger projects. And remember the volumes. Those are that, that make 
make you really powerful, really beneficial and really important. If you can bring those volumes, um, everybody wants to keep you in the team and they will ask you to, to uh, tell where, where the company should be going. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hello. Hey. hey, thanks for sharing. I really get inspired a lot from your speech. And um, my question is, during the, our research cycle, we're always facing a lot of like uh, problem statements and user needs. So sometimes when we're doing research, we're facing 300 even more user needs and problems. And for your theory, like start from small and grow big, but how do you like to pick that the key problems and how do you define the problems that really have the business impact before you're doing that? Yeah. Very good question. Um, there's no easy, easy answer to that. Um, as a, I suppose it all starts from, from the, the higher goals that the, the company team wants to gain. Um, and then you need to go, go to, to understand what are the biggest pain points for the, for the end user. So what is the one that creates frustration? Are there some things that prevent them from use, use, using uh, the product? Um, are there some like uh, blockers that cut the, the usage flow? So the most impactful problems are the ones that you need to, to uh, consider first. I usually, when I, I have my, my findings, I try to, to rate them um, according to the uh, significance or the impact. So the, having like major, uh, moderate and minor findings. Um, so the, the major ones are those that will block user from doing something. Um, and those are the ones that you need to fix. Then the second one is the more like moderate ones um, that will in, like impact um, the experience, but not, doesn't necessarily prevent. And then you, the minor ones, which are more like nice to have things. Once you have these um, these categories, you need to work together with the um, I don't know if it's the development team or or whoever do, that will uh, do the change, and and together with them understand what is the like how easy those changes are to do and with your UX significance and the de development team's um, work estimate you get some kind of like a roadmap on what is feasible and when you can cre start creating roadmaps but the main thing is that you start doing things as quickly as possible so that you you see the change you see the impact that will prove you right and then you can continue working on, on stuff so I suppose working in, in agile mode and trying to concentrate in the biggest pain points first would be the starting point. Uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, my question I think is revolving around metrics. Um, I guess, at what point do you, do you feel the change cycle will be considered too long? Or what, is the, what is the period that you need? Uh, at what point you need to be able to measure something? Well, it depends completely on, on, on like how the, the company operates. operates. Um, what I try to do is, is I try to introduce metrics that I can prove already before the implementation starts. So on something that you can prototype easily and, and then do usable testing. So kind of like measure the solution before it's being implemented so that if there's anything that you need to change more, um, change it again and again. So doing it in iteration. Um, but the change cycle, um, it's, uh, I, don't know, so I suppose there's no one, one answer to that. Um, I used to, to work in one team where we, we did two week sprints and we were testing testing during that two weeks. So the, the um, team would introduce something 
on week one, we would test it on week two, and, and they were preparing the next one on week three, and we were then presenting during that, that time the results from the fir first one, and then we were testing the next one on, on the week four. So it was like taking, taking turns in, in the week. Um, but it really depends on how the team works. If there are still some waterfall companies, um, and with, with them, um, you need to do bigger things in shorter period because you need to have everything ready uh, before the implementation starts. In Agile, you have more freedom because you can integrate your testing and your metrics to the, to the, the work and the, the uh, development process easily. Thank you. Will there be any more questions for Anna? If not, uh, UX would like to um, present a token of appreciation to Anna for her time. And Marcus will present a gift to her. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anna, for